<coughs> okay, so since we want to do everything hands-on, we compute now some torsion groups. And yeah, we will only compute torsion groups for n equal to 2 and 3 because everything else would be too crazy. At least too crazy to do it here on the blackboard. <coughs> Okay, yeah, here's also a funny anecdote. Um, so if we, um, um, want to compute, um, the points of order two, um, then this is, Yeah, well, this doesn't really matter. But as we also know from before, um, those are the points um, with y coordinate 0. So the points of order 2 are those with y coordinate 0. Mm. That means we need to compute uh, um, the roots of this. Um, that means um, roots, just as before, where we only considered rational points. And now, um, as I like playing with ChatGPT, I asked it, um, what are the roots of x cubed plus x? <laughs> and it said, <laughs> this polynomial has four roots, namely um, 0, 1, and then something um, complex, so two other roots that are complex conjugated. And yeah, well, as you see, this is um, x times x squared plus 1. So this is x minus i times x plus i, and it has degree 3, so it only has 3 roots. Yeah, this I found very funny, and of course the, the answer was, um, again, uh, written in a way so that normal people would not see that it's wrong. This is, yeah, very fascinating, I find that. Okay, so the, um, the points of order 2, are, um, 0, 0, i, 0, and minus i, 0. And uh, the rational points of order 2 are only um, the point at infinity and 0, 0. And as soon as we go to q joint i, we have the full possible torsion points. So um, in one of the propositions before, we saw that um, if we allow anything, then the torsion uh, group is z mod nz cross z mod nz, and this is here z mod 2z cross z mod 2z, um, and the points all lie in qi. Or the um, coefficients, uh, coordinates of the points. Okay, um, what about um, the points of order three? Okay, what does it mean that a point has order three? Um, that's also something that we um, used several times, I think. Point of order 3 means 3p three is 0. That means 2p is minus p, but the x-coordinate is the same. So the x-coordinate of 2p is the x-coordinate of p. This is equivalent um, to p has order 3. So we just um, take our addition formulas. And so we're, we're still talking about this curve. 
And with our formulas, we get x to the 4 times 2x squared plus 1. So this is from um, doubling. And this has to be the same as the x coordinate of p, which was just x. Um, yeah, so since y squared is equal to x cubed plus x, we multiply everything out, put everything on one side, And um, so the x-coordinates of the points with order 3 are the roots of this polynomial. How many are there? There are four. And every root of this polynomial gives two possible y's. So four uh, roots give eight points. And together with the point at infinity, we get nine points. Um, did I write them down? Yeah. So in, um, in, the, in the exercise sheet, you can also, if, if you have to solve things like this, you can, of course, use a computer. And I would recommend Wolfram Alpha because you don't have to use Sage and put every condition in. So in Wolfram Alpha, usually with... Uh, um, polynomials of this degree, it gives you the correct answer. Um, yeah, usually. <laughs> um, so, with that, of course, you can also, well, this you can solve by hand because it has no x cubed and no x, but still, you probably don't want to do this. So this is a root. <coughs> and then, of course, since this only has x to the 4 and x to the 2, minus alpha is also a root. And i times square root of 3 alpha to the minus 1 and minus i square root of 3 alpha to the minus 1. Those are the roots. <coughs> and then we can write down <coughs> the group. Um, we also I have one, so, and then E of 3 is the point at infinity, then it's alpha plus minus beta, alpha plus minus I beta, I over 3 alpha, plus minus 2 minus i now no this yeah only goes here So this looks a bit crazy, but what uh, what do we know? What do we want to know? Now the question is: What field is this where we adjoin all the uh, coordinates? Yeah, we can uh, we can look a bit at coordinates and see that um, it has to contain i because we can uh, uh, 
uh, play around it a bit here. Here's I and here's alpha. So um, yeah, we now here here's beta and here's I beta. So that's where we um, can at least construct I, and it also has uh, to contain beta. And I also wrote here that it's non-abelian of order 16, but I don't know if we want to prove this or if we just assume that someone proves this. <laughs> okay, we don't prove this, but... Uh, I put this in quotation marks because when Silverman and Tate say it's a nice exercise, I'm not so sure about this. <coughs> but they say that this is non-abelian and of order 16. Um, yeah, and, well, we don't need the non-abelian, but um, with order 16, we can already see that um, QE3 is QI comma beta. So we adjoin um, those two, and then we get everything, because everything can, can be constructed from that. Well, if you look at it, then your gut feeling should say, oh, yes, this could be true, because yeah, well, here we have the fourth square root of 27, but um, this will um, work out with this. We have square root of 3 that comes from here. We have the alpha. We have the i. We should have everything covered. So that sounds good. What about uh, the points of order four? Yeah, we, we only do the points of order four here because luckily they work out well. <laughs> um, boop, 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 boop. <coughs> So P is order 4, if and only if 2P has order 2, which means the Y coordinate of 2P is 0. And then we just look at the formulas, and this means that this Is zero. Yeah, and a, a generic polynomial of degree six has no nice solutions, but here um, this actually has nice solutions. So this is x minus one times x plus one times x cubed plus six x squared plus one. So it's basically a polynomial of degree four because we can forget about this part. And if we call alpha, so the here's an i, uh, square root of 2 minus 1 times i, then the roots are <coughs> of course 1 and minus 1, but alpha minus alpha, alpha to the minus 1, and minus alpha to the minus 1. Yeah, well, this is uh, very nice because then we already know for sure that uh, for the x coordinate, we for the x coordinates, we just need to join alpha and get get everything here. Where here it was a bit more complicated because we also had a factor i squared of three, uh, which made it a bit more whoops complicated. And with beta 1 plus i times square root of 2 
minus 1, we get that the points of order 4 1 plus minus square root of 2 minus 1 plus minus i square root of 2. So here you see, well, in that step we can forget about those, um, those factors, but in the end, of course, we still have to consider those roots because they could give um, a, a y-coordinate that's not uh, rational. So here we actually meet those because we get i and square root of 2. And the roots with the alpha, alpha plus minus beta, minus alpha plus minus i beta, <coughs> alpha to the minus 1, plus minus alpha to the minus 2 beta, and the last one, So we can pretty fast see that this is at least inside. So we have i and we have square root of 2 just because of those two points. And um, since... Yeah, this um, has order 4, and beta is um, algebraic in i and square root of 2. So if we adjoin i and square root of 2, this is already in here. This has degree 4. This has degree 4. Then with the beta, we don't get anything more than this i and square root of 2. So because of this degree, and because of beta only consisting of i and square root of 2, it means there's an equality. So QE4 is exactly QI square root of 2. This is basically how it works all the time. We um, write down the equations, which either come from um, our multiplication formulas or from if we would look at higher degrees than from the division polynomials, then solve um, um, the uh, solve for the roots of the polynomials with Wolfram well, Alpha or some other computer program, and then look um, for generators of of the number field that they generate. Okay. So this in itself would be interesting, but now what we do is um, we kind of uh, want to um, represent our maybe too complicated torsion groups in uh, easier ways. And an easy way to, to look at things are, for example, matrices, because they're nice to multiply and to work with. So now we want to find a way to connect uh, the complicated torsion points to matrices. And I will raise the board. <coughs> yeah, and while I raise the board, I will tell you that today at 4.15, there's a probably very nice talk or oh, definitely very nice talk by Fabian Pazuki. Um, maybe in Sitzungszimmer, but probably also in Maximum, because maybe there are many people who want to attend and then Sitzungszimmer is too, too small. And before, I don't know how long before, but before there are cookies and coffee. Maybe from 3.30 on or something like that in the Schlauch, behind the Sitzungszimmer. And Fabian gives very nice talks. It's about, it is actually about elliptic curves and kind of a pl application or some theory with graph theory. Um, but all his talks are very nice. 
So independent of the topic, you should go there. <coughs> yeah, very good. Okay, so how can we get from um, torsion groups to matrices? So the torsion groups are, well, they look a bit like a, a vector space. Um, so it must be possible to find two points um, that generate all the torsion points. So sure if my notation is fine, but yeah, I, I'll take this notation. So if we have a map from the torsion group to itself <coughs> that does something, then we can just write it as a matrix that acts on the basis here. Just like in linear algebra where you have a vector space and a linear map from the vector space to itself, then you just take a basis and then you can write the, line the linear map as a matrix. And the same is what we do here. And since we always have um, Z mod NZ cross Z mod NZ, we will always uh, just uh, care about two by two matrices, which is very nice because they're fast to write down. <laughs> okay, so keep in mind that we have um, this. And this, and this, um, because we need this um, all the time. We take um, we take what I just erased here, namely the curve. this curve and we will take those two points. Um, here with the two torsion points, uh, it doesn't matter which two points we take as long as we don't take the point at infinity since um, uh, the double of one of those points is never one of the other points because it's always the point at infinity and the structure of the um, group just tells us if we take two points and call them P1 and P2, and the third point must be the sum of those. So if we now look at um, the Galba group, of Q adjoin the two torsion coordinates over Q, this was QI. So this is just complex multiplication and the identity. Uh, complex um, conjugation. <laughs> and then we can just um, um, yeah, find out what um, the identity and what sigma does um, to our points. Of course, the identity does nothing, so we don't have to um, write that down. But sigma of P1, P1 is 
i comma zero. So this is sigma of i comma sigma of zero. Sigma of i is minus i because sigma is complex uh, complex conjugation. And this is uh, P1 plus P2. Oh, and this was P2. <laughs> Oops. No. Okay, what is uh, sigma of P1? P1 is 0, 0. This is sigma of 0, sigma of 0, which is again 0, 0. And now we can write this in a matrix, just like in linear algebra 1. So this is P1. So what does the sigma do on our first basis vector? It puts it back to the first basis vector. So we have 1 here and 0 here. And what does it do with P2? It puts it to P1 plus P2. So 1 P1 plus 1 P2. And this is the representing matrix for sigma. <laughs> and we can do this, um, of course, for any elliptic curve, but also for any n. We could also do this with larger n. Then we could get larger numbers here, but we still get two by two matrices. Um, And then we get a map from the Galois group of this Q E N over Q. Two the two by the invertible two by two matrices um, with coefficients in Z mod N Z. Why invertible? Because um, uh, our our maps here are in the Galois group. The Galois group is a group, so they have an inverse. So also the matrices have to be have to be invertible. So here we have the elements of the Galois group, and we map them to their representing matrix, or representation matrix. Yeah, very good in time. Whoa.
And we call this, um, this map the Galois representation. Uh, maybe we should put that here. Yeah, and we will prove prove it here, so we will prove the Galois representation theorem. which goes from the Galois group of E of N over Q to GL2 Z mod NZ. Mm. Nah. <laughs> is a one-to-one -one homomorphism of groups. So, yeah, I don't know why they call it one-to-one, -one, not injective. I like this word better. Okay, so it's not necessarily subjective, but it's injective. Uh, which is not that hard to show, since um, we can look what the kernel is. Kernel means something gets mapped um, to the unit matrix. But what does that mean? That means um, it fixes the generators. So it fixes everything. And what fixes everything is only the identity. Yeah, I will give an example of where it's really not subjective. And we will talk about when is it subjective um, and some conjecture or one conjecture. Um, as I said before, we have um, analogies. So if we look at multiplication in C star, we have torsion points, z to the n is 1. And we can look at addition in E, where torsion is n to the p is the point at infinity. Here we get the cyclotomic field. If we join um, this, uh, and here we get, 
Yeah, actually, there is no word for that, which is weird, actually. So if we <coughs> look, uh, or, yeah, then we have here the representations. So the Galois group and the representation sigma goes to rho, so this representing matrix and here, yeah, well we can basically do the same thing here but there's a uh, there it's not really helping <laughs> because there we would just go to GL1, Z mod NZ, so the one by one matrices with coefficients in Z mod NZ, so just those numbers, since we just permute um, this, um, uh, this root of unity to some some other um, one, but here, the, so the difference is that here this is bijective and here it's only injective. The fact that it's injective makes it uh, useful for us in the first place, so since um, this would neither be injective nor surjective, then we would probably not consider it at all, but the point is it's injective and as we will see it's um, also basically surjective um, whenever we need it to, <laughs> maybe. Um, so let us compute uh, the image in that case and see um, whether it's um, surjective here. So in that case, um, so still this x cubed plus x. Uh, what is the image of the Galois representation? Um, first we have this. Um, since this was the representing matrix for complex conjugation and of course, we also have um, the unit matrix, which is the representation matrix of the identity. But um, if we look up or think about it, what elements does GL2 Z mod 2 Z have? It has six elements. So here we only have two. Um, so this is the image. But GL2, Z mod 2, Z is 6. So it's now, in this case, it's pretty far from being subjective. But this is not always the case. So now we can basically go in two directions. Um, one direction is um, when does it happen that the Galois uh, image is um, the full GL2 Z mod NZ group? Um, and when does basically the opposite happen? 
Because what is well, not so nice is, or not so easy for us to handle is, that GL2 of Z mod NZ is not abelian. And non-abelian groups are, well, I would say harder to handle than abelian groups. Um, and it would be nice uh, or make things easier, but also maybe also in it more uninteresting um, if the image is small and maybe abelian. So there are two directions. When is it small and when is it big? The answer to when is it small will basically come next two lectures, I think, because um, there we will care about curves with complex multiplication. And if we don't have this, and we have this famous theorem, Um, without complex multiplication, and next time we will see what complex multiplication means. And the important part is, if you take a random elliptic curve, then the chances are high it does not have complex multiplication. So this is the generic case. <coughs> So it says, if we have an elliptic curve defined over the rational numbers, then there is a point from where on uh, the Galois representation is surjective, or for, for all um, n co-prime to n. The thing is that we are also uh, mostly interested in um, uh, where this small n, So we're talking about the Galois representation of the small n torsion points. Um, usually, we, we want to consider n to be a prime. So being co-prime to something else means from some point onwards, if, uh, if n is prime. And um, I tried to look it up, but I uh, couldn't find it. I usually forget it. So the conjecture is that you can either even take this capital N to be independent of E and to be something like 37, I think. So pretty small, which means that um, basically all the Galois representations that are important, that are far away uh, from being small, um, are subjective. And this is, um, I think, the, the proof of that is probably also like 100 pages or so. And this is really useful, really useful. Um, Okay, yeah, I would say um, we stop here. And um, next time we will talk about complex multiplication and what does that mean, what happens there, and what can we do with curves that have complex multiplication. Thank you.